And I believe, God, that there is a word from the Lord for you today, and I believe that God will speak to us. Okay, so you guys here are the amens, yeah? And also, the amen people in front always get the most spit by the preacher, so hopefully I don't spit on you, but forgive me if by passion I just, you know, just, just clean it up. I'll try my best not to. I'll try my best not to. But amen. Let's, let's go into the word of God. How many of you are excited for the word of God today? Come with me to John chapter 2. And let's, let's go to John chapter 2 and we'll be reading from 1 to 12. And I'll be reading for us. Amen. The word of the Lord reads, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Everyone say with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not come yet. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Everyone say up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, had now become wine and did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, verses 10, and said to them, everyone serves the good wine first. When people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and the disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciple and they stayed there for a few days. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you because this is a day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad. We ask that as we gather to hear what your spirit is saying that no flesh will glory in your presence, Lord that you will speak through me and you would illuminate the eyes of our understanding that we may understand what is the hope of our calling and what is your plan for us as, as individuals, as couples, oh God. We ask that you would give us wisdom. We thank you for the, the, the presence of your spirit and we just ask that you would do as you please. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. The story of Jesus is so important. Everything about the scriptures testify about the person of Jesus. In John here, we see that there is a description about the wedding he attended. Now, it's very interesting because Jesus' days were all so significant that he couldn't just have a casual day because he was on a time scale. Everyone say he had a time scale. And because he had this, he had to be careful with where he went to, who he hung out with, and how he lived his life. So by virtue of this now, he was, he was revealing himself to the world, to, to, to ministry as it were. But the first place he went was to a wedding. Now this puzzled me because I thought as a preacher, the first thing he would do is have a crusade, a conference. Come meet the Son of God. You know, I thought the first thing he would do is have a big crusade where he introduces himself as the Messiah so that the Jews and all the Pharisees and the Sadducees can get to know him as the true son of God. I expected him to start his life and reveal himself as the son of God through a crusade. But he did it by going to a wedding. Slap the person beside you and say, Jesus loves weddings. First thing he did was he went to a wedding. Now, we should not look at this carnally because he didn't go for the jollof. He was on a mission. 
And he had a deep understanding of his calling, and that's why he went to a wedding first. You may say, Philip, why didn't he go to a birthday? He went to a wedding first because his destiny and the ultimate reason why he came on the earth was tied to a wedding. It was tied to the fact that his father, before the foundations of the earth, promised him a bride. And you get a bride through a wedding. Through the official ceremony and all the procedures that go through a wedding, you obtain yourself as a groom, a wife. So he had to be in the fullness of God, Omar, had to go to a wedding to see how on the earth grooms receive their brides so that he can prepare himself for why he will go through what he will go through. So he went to a wedding first. And at this wedding, whilst everything was going on, Jesus was paying attention to how they were serving the wine, how the groom was moving. Now, one of the things that made me think was, how many people invited Jesus to their weddings? And how many weddings did he say yes to? He went to this one wedding. The title of today's sermon is The Only Wedding He Attended. He went to one wedding. I can imagine that after they found out that he is the son of David, that he is the son of God, everybody will want them at his wedding, of course. If he's going to go there and he's going to be a, a source of uh, 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 illumination to your ceremony, you would want him to your wedding. But why did this couple get the honor of having the son of God as a guest in their occasion? Someone said they probably did courtship right. They probably allowed God guide them through how they were dating. And Jesus, when he looked at his table, as we could imagine, Peter saying, oh, Lord, my brother is getting married. Are you coming? He's like, nope. Your brother didn't honor me in that. And then this strange people that we don't even know anything about, the couple, he goes to their wedding. And this shows that the way we do relationships have to be guided by the word of God so that we can enjoy the presence of the Son of God. Now, what happened is in verses 2, it says here that Jesus was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Jesus was invited. If you think about a kingdom marriage or kingdom romance situation, what makes it kingdom is not that two Christians come together and get married. What makes it kingdom is that two people who have individually and collectively submitted to God, his plans and his purposes have come together to form a union. That's what makes a kingdom marriage or romance or relationship. So just you could be two Christians and get married and that doesn't just qualify as a kingdom marriage. Are you submitted to God yourself? Do you have a personal conviction about the calling of God on your life? Do you have a personal submission to the call of God on your life? When that happens and two of you get together, then you can have Nyla. And she will carry a grace that's unique because her father has his own individual submission to Christ. Her mother has her own individual submission to Christ. And both of them have a collective submission that produces the kingdom of God. So we have to be careful. As a generation, we should not just go by what's on Instagram. We should not just go by what's on Twitter and just be saying, yes, I have a kingdom marriage. Oh, goals, goals. No. You should be submitting to Christ yourself and whoever you choose, because it's your choice, <laughs> whoever you choose, that now produces the kingdom of God in that union. So Jesus was invited to this wedding with his disciples. And when you think about a disciple, you're looking at someone who has received the teachings of a master. You're looking at somebody who has received the systems of a master. So what, he, what happens here is that Jesus is coming, but his disciples are also coming to the wedding. That means in your courtship, in your relationship, you can't just have Jesus and not have his systems. You can't just have Jesus and not have his disciples. You can't just ostracize your relationship to become an individual situation where his disciples are not allowed. Someone say accountability. 
So this invitation, and don't worry, we're going to shout in a second. This invitation was very, very unique because Jesus didn't just go to any wedding. He was invited and he went. So even the way you do relationship, you have to allow Jesus come into your, your relationship, your wedding, your marriage, as not just as a guest, but as a Lord. Because if he comes as a guest, by the moment he's starting to arrange things, you're going to be offended. Because you expected him to come as a guest when he's a Lord. So if you have a Lord in your union, you should expect that he would arrange some things so that it can look like where he's coming from. It can look like a king dumb. It can look like a king is in the midst of this union. So Jesus said yes to the wedding. He went with his disciples. And guess what happened? The wine ran out. But remember, he's not just a guest in this place. He is Lord in this place. So what he does is he's, he's, he's seated there waiting because how many of you know that just because he's present doesn't mean he will tend to it. You have to tell him what you want him to do. You have to open your heart. The Bible says that we must pray without ceasing and through prayer we begin to give Jesus room to enter in what we want him to enter. You see just because it's a Christian marriage doesn't mean that everything is going to be all right. You're going to go through some stuff but if you pray then you give the king room to deal with the situation. Someone say prayer. And prayer is so important because Jesus could have sat there and what Mary did, his mother was, she prayed to him. She didn't just go, she didn't just go and start wondering, oh, what would this man do? He's here. He should know what's up. No, she laid prayers before him and she said, Lord, the wine is finished. And sometimes in your life, you have to have the surrender and the humility to be able to say, my wine is finished. My wine is finished. Brothers, she wants to go on a date, but you don't have the bread. Tell her my wine is finished. I don't have wine for this. My wine is finished. Why is this important? Because the transparency she brought to Jesus gave Jesus the ability to attend to the situation. Jesus wasn't just going to stand there and start showing himself. He knew every move he made was going to count onto something. So he had to make sure that these people, through prayer, show me their submission so that I can act on their behalf. And she prayed to the Lord and said, the wine is finished. The wine is finished. And there are times in your relationship where you should not hide the fact that your wine is finished. Why? Because whatever you hide gains authority over you. Yes. And what happens is when you're, say, when you're acting like you still have wine, when you don't have wine, is that you end up in a situation where you're exposed. And you didn't have to be exposed. You just had to be transparent. And you can't build a relationship based on pretense. This is why Jesus didn't just die in his bedroom. Jesus didn't just die around Peter's house. Jesus didn't just die somewhere in Galilee or Bethlehem. Jesus didn't just die somewhere around Nazareth. He died at the top of the mountain where all eyes can see the embarrassment, can see the shame, can see everything that he's going through so that now he has power over death. Death. He has power over sin because I died in the open. You can't kill me in secret. So he had to do it openly. He had to open up himself so that there could be transformation. And in your life and in your walk with God, if you want to see the power of God, you have to open up yourself. Do me a favor, spread your hands like this and say, Lord, do whatever you will. Lord, do whatever you will. Come on, don't hit nobody. Just say, Lord, do whatever you will. And as you're doing that as a lifestyle, you find that truly you have power over sin. You have power over death. You have power over limitation. Your life begins to become fruitful because he is in your midst.
so they prayed to him and said, Lord, we don't have wine. There's no wine at the moment. Is there anything you can do for us? I remember. There was a girl I liked before Caitlin. <laughs> and I'll be honest. I went to pray about it. And every time I went to pray, as soon as I say, Lord, is this my wife? He'll say, no. Now, you have to understand, have you seen the TikTok where it's like, Lord, I need seven billion pounds? And it's like, no. It's like the, the answers God was giving me was always immediate. And I was wondering, no, Philip, is you talking to you? Let God speak. You know them ones where you like the person and you're thinking, no, that's God. He's saying no. And I was like, eh, for months, I was telling him, he kept saying no, and the no was so strong and consistent. And I was wondering, like, why? But, but we have a good vibe, we have a friendship. And I went one day of my own accord. I told her, like, yo, like, I think we could be such. She said no. <laughs> <laughs> but then she came back and said she was scared, and she was lying. But I said, another story, but she said no. So... This put me in a situation where I chopped breakfast that I didn't necessarily have to chop. <laughs> you know what I mean? If I just listened to what the Lord was saying to me. So you can't come to pray to him and not expect him to answer you. No means no. <laughs> this is what was interesting. Before I moved to Caitlin, I just knew Caitlin Nunez, the preacher. She's a great preacher. <laughs> I just knew her as that. Now, I started to be drawn to her through the, listen, don't judge me, don't try it. I started to, to be drawn to her from her teachings and I thought, you know, maybe me and this girl can actually be together. And then I prayed about her because you see, in the kingdom, we pray about things before we move. Yes, we don't move because she has a nice picture on the Insta page. We move because there's been green light. So I prayed about her, and the first day, I prayed about Caitlin. He said, yes. I told myself, Philip, you need to allow God to speak. My, my pattern, you know, pray for me. <laughs> Doubt, you know, and I'm like, you need to allow God to speak. But every time I kept praying, before I knew her, I would ask him, Lord, is this my wife? And he would say yes, for months. So what was happening was God was speaking to me, and I allowed his voice, but I couldn't believe that he was speaking to me. And I put myself in a situation where first I experienced heartbreak that I didn't need to. And then I experienced his will for me. What am I saying? When you pray to God about a person, believe what he tells you. When you ask God about a person, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, it's not just always your mind, it's not just always your voice. There's a spirit within you that guides you and gives you inspiration and direction, even concerning your spouse. And so we cannot become negligent about the voice of God within us when we pray to him. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does, it, what does this have to do with me? My time has not come. And even though God was saying to me, yes, about Caitlin, he still told me not to DM her. Because you see, some of you just enter DM. Hey, your picture is nice. No. He told me not to DM her. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting. Seeing her recent uploads, I want to comment. He's like, nope. <laughs> You're not smart. Wait. And... And through that process, what was happening was he was changing my attitude. He was changing the way I perceived and pursued a woman. So that I no longer see a woman as just something that out of my will and marriage as something that out of my will I can handle. But I will now begin to see marriage as something where he needs to give me strength, guidance, and leading to do. Because as a man, when we get into relationships, we have three main uh, positions to play. We have to be a priest, a provider, and a what? Protector. So if I'm going to do this, it's not just by strength. It's not just by my own wisdom. I'm going to need patience. I'm going to need wisdom from God. And through me waiting on him, I was learning all of those things subconsciously. And there are things that God is teaching you now whilst you're single that are going to be the power and the advantage of your marriage. 
There are things that God is teaching you now that are going to be the strengths you have to be able to build a kingdom home for him. So Jesus said to her, he said, fill the jars with water. But between when Jesus said, fill the jars with water, he had told her, my time has not come yet. So what hap- how long was this time and what happened in between then? One of the things that, that, that happens is when you're choosing a spouse, you have to follow where the presence of God is leading you. You have to follow the person that has the presence of God on them. So it's not just going to be based on aesthetics. It has to be based on the presence. You have to make your decisions about a life partner and how you're going to build your home based on the presence of God. One of the things I discerned about Caitlin was that there was a presence around her. Even though I never, heard, I never sat with her, but I discerned that there was the presence of God. And the first time I met her, I was, I was too happy. Now, yeah. and you know, the Bible says in his presence there's fullness of joy and there's pleasures forever. So I was happy. Well, of course, I looked like a beg, but I didn't mind. <laughs> I was happy. And one of the things I noticed was that she was so busy with God. Her heart was so committed to God. There was a presence of the Lord around her and around how she guided her and made decisions about her life that made me know that this person is most likely the will of God for me. So where's the presence? Is this person busy on Twitter? Busy trying to go to Sexy Fish every weekend? Or can you see that there is a level of submission to Christ? It's a restaurant, by the way. (laughs) Everyone's like, what? It's a restaurant, Mayfair, come on. How many of you know it? Ah, Pizzo, before they'll say, I was saying. Okay, so I'm safe. There's a presence. There's a presence there. And you have to discern your relationship by the presence. Jesus was saying that because presence had not yet come upon him to do the miracle that they needed. So there had to be a waiting time. Yes, there was a presence upon Caitlin, but I did not have the permission to ask her out yet. So I had to endure. I had to stay platonic. One of her frustrations was that I was so platonic. Rona, you remember this? She almost didn't like me again. But that's because I was under instructions. And now, my, listen, everyone asks me how's marriage. I say, it's good. I have no wahala. I am blessed. I can tell you for free. My business is prospering because of her. <laughs> I am blessed. But here's the thing. The process, that blessing was there, but the process makes that blessing manifest. So Jesus said, my time has not come. And then a little while later, he, 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 he goes to give them instructions. Can you wait on God? You know, in the kingdom, waiting is how we get ahead. We don't get ahead by running. We get ahead by sitting. We don't get ahead by talking. We get ahead by staying silent. The Bible says, in quietness is your strength. Because in the kingdom, we, we, we serve a God that, that runs exactly opposite to how the world runs. So you're not going to win her, bro, by doing the most. You're going to win her by following what God is telling you to do and the timings he's putting you on. See, just because you have six figures now doesn't mean you're ready to propose. Did he tell you to propose? Just because now you bought your house doesn't mean you are ready to propose. Did he tell you? Did he give you the green light? Has God led you? As many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. The leading. Can you wait on God? Can you wait on God? Is, are you ready? Have you judged your readiness by the fact that now in your early 30s or your mid 20s, have you judged your readiness by what man is telling you? Or is the spirit of God in you shining the light of your path? Some of you know that in this season, yeah, you are dangerous. You have nice worship. You love God. You smile. We love you in the house of God but you will finish anybody you get with now. And, and some of you should stop 
trying to trigger other people like, yo, Wagwan, what's up with you and John? Stop, stop trying to, to, to make them make a move. Allow God do what he's doing in their life. Because you don't know what God is seeing them do in secret. So you have to allow God process them. You have to allow God do his work inside of them. Some of you look ready outside, but you are dangerous. And here's the thing. God loves that danger. Because that's what he's working on you. That's, that's the premise through which he's building a relationship with you. So the things in you that are still being processed, allow him process it. Yes, your friend just got engaged to and there's a proposal party. Celebrate with her, but be aware that, oh boy, I'm danger. Let Lord do what you will with me. Go there, dance, do, but don't start saying, Lord, when is my time? You know that if he marries you over now, divorce is not too far. We have to be honest. We have to be honest. Because we think divorce is something big that just happens and oh my gosh, sometimes it's little, little things over time. And it's those little, little things that God is trying to process out of you. And you have to allow God do this work inside of you so that out of you, he can raise a glorious family. He can raise the type of family that he can say, have you seen my servant Job? He can brag about how ready and how put together you are according to his will. So there was a waiting time between when he turned that water and when they prayed about it. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up. Hold on. It says wait, but it says they shall mount up. And some of you are worried that you're single now, but you don't know you're mounting up. Some of you are worried that there's nobody in your DMs. Nobody's moving to you. You don't know God is mounting you up. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Some of you don't realize that God, that some of the things he's teaching you now in your singleness is going to make you the best mother. The best. As in, all your daughter's children would rely on you for wisdom. No shade to their moms. Better don't be their moms. Be the mom. You know what I mean? The one that God has processed. So you have to allow God work on the inside of you. You have to allow him take his time with you. God has not forgotten you. I know, I know when we're, we're, we're in a generation that makes it look like God can just forget people and there are the favorites. No, each and every one of us, ha God has a plan for. Let me tell you something. You are a strategy in the hand of God. You are a strategy. You are, you are a battle act that he needs to position properly so that you don't miss it. Slap the person beside you and tell them you're a strategy, you're a strategy, you're a strategy. And you know you don't make strategic moves anyhow. You have to calculate. So some of you, God is calculating. Mm, he has such a, such a good heart for evangelism. Uh, let me train him for about two years in this and then I'll send her to him. So, so, so now you're busy on the field of, of evangelism and you're wondering when, when would she come? All you have to do is trust in the Lord with all of your mind and know that he has prepared that person for you and in due process, he would reveal that person. So the waiting time was not a frustrating time. Because there was a work that was being done in between. Waiting is important because when Jesus then said to them, he said in verses 6, fill the jars with water and they fill them up to the brim. You see, if they were not waiting, some of them would have been quite rebellious to that instruction. But what waiting did was that it created anticipation in them. You see, the way your faith grows is by waiting. When, when God is teaching you faith in this season, maybe you're trusting God for a job or you're trusting God to open up a door for you. When God is telling you to wait or it looks like nothing is happening, what he's doing is growing you in faith. The disciples ask the Lord, increase our faith. And sometimes you don't realize that the type of faith you have now is not going to sustain you for the future. So God has to take you through several seasons of waiting. How many of you are waiting on God for something? 
What's happening behind the scenes is that God is increasing your faith. So that when you get there, you don't worship what he has done. You worship who did it. Because you understand that through waiting, I grew. Through waiting, I understood that after all, I'm not that, that, that uh, reckless. After all, I have some sort, sort of self-control. After all, I have some wisdom. Actually, I like playing chess. Actually, I'm actually good at this. You start learning things about yourself because you were waiting on the Lord. So he asked for the jars. And he said, fill the jars with water. The jars can represent your vessel, you and I. And the water is the word. Are you growing in the word? Are you growing in the word? Has your knowledge of the word of God increased? Has your knowledge of the word of God become more than what it was when you were 18? I challenge you. Or do you know the same memory verses that you knew from primary school till date? Stop the person beside you and say, get up to date. The jars, he said, fill them with water. And the water is, is the word of God in Ephesians 5.26. He says, husbands, love your wives and wash them with the water of the... So you have to, you, you have, to have the word. Brothers, you need to know the word. Because there's some days that you'll be so tired. Yet she wants to gist. She wants to tell you about her cases in court. She wants to tell you about everything. She's been, and you just want to rest. What keeps you listening because that's, that's how her love cup is filled. What keeps you listening is the fact that you have a word in you. You've allowed the word take root on the inside of you. There are one or two memory verses that are keeping your ears up. There are one or two memory verses that are strengthening your heart. And that's what makes your marriage beautiful. It's not the big things. Thank God for them. It's the little moments. Anyone who has a great marriage will tell you, it's the good morning, it's the kindness, it's the gentleness, it's the self-control. That's what makes marriage beautiful. The big things are only a byproduct of that. Only. And if you focus on the big things, yet the small things suffer, you would have a lot of depression in your home. You would have issues in your home. There will always be an offense. There will always be something on your mind that you need to just let out. Because the small things are compiling. So you have to fill the jar with water. God is trying to fill you up with the water of the word. He's trying to make sure you grow in revelation. He's trying to make sure that you know more scripture now than you used to. He's trying to make sure you understand Jesus more than the Muslim. He's trying to make sure you understand Jesus more than the theologians. You that carry the spirit of Jesus must know Jesus more than those who don't carry the spirit and only have the books. He's trying to make sure. And as he does this, there will come a time where he will tell them, serve the water. Now notice, when Jesus told them to serve the water, he didn't say, water, turn to wine. Guess what? He just said, serve it. Why? Because in the serving is the transformation. That as you serve, as you're diligent in the house of God, come on, who am I preaching to? That as you're giving Jesus your all, as you're surrendering to the Lamb of God, as you're singing your worship, as you're giving him the glory, as you're giving him the praise, honor, and adoration, as you're giving him your offering, as you're giving him your tithe, as you're giving him all you have, he's changing your life. He's making you better than your mother and father than your brothers and sisters Jesus is working on you as you're serving him I'm sorry I didn't plan that he's working on you as you're serving some of you are thinking, why am I coming to church? Sometimes I have to queue. Keep queuing. Keep queuing. Because let me tell you what's happening. As you're queuing, your hunger for God is going... And as that hunger is going up, faith is rising in you. And you're able to walk with God more than you have ever been able to. As you're serving, you are being transformed. As you're singing your ordinary worship song, 
the water is turning to wine. As you're doing the basic mundane things about our beloved Christian faith, you are being transformed to the very image of the Son of God. As you're giving Jesus your surrender, he's working on the type of husband and the model of wife you would be. As you give him your heart, he's working on the type of friend you would be to your son and daughter. As you give him your life, he's working on the type of spouse he's going to give you as you give him your soul he's making your marriage blessed even without you praying about it because in the serving is the transformation as they serve the wine as they serve the water it changed to wine when the time for tasting came it didn't taste like water you see the water within itself had the potential to be wine but it needed the presence and exposure of Jesus for it to be changed. So this is why it's not enough for you to go with a life without devotion. This is why it's not enough for you to just come to church. You have to have a devotion. Someone say, I need a personal devotion. Because in your personal devotion, what's happening is that Jesus is regulating you so that you are 100% compatible with his destiny for you. Your personal devotion. Your personal devotion. That as you're serving him in and out of the church, he's changing you. He's preparing you. That what you're currently doing now is not all God has for you. That what you're currently going through now is not the summary of your life. That the summary of your life is hidden in the mystery, which is Christ. And as Christ is revealed, we also are being revealed. That as Christ is being made known, we also are being made known. That his glory becomes the very oxygen that we live by. Someone say, in the serving is the transforming. So Jesus asked them to serve the wine. And as they served it, they found that it had become wine. And he made a comment. He said, everyone leaves the best wine for the last. But you have brought us the best wine. Everyone serves the poor wine first and leaves the best for the last. And you have indeed saved the best for the last. Now, it's interesting here. Because that water, no one tells us where that water came from. No one told us where they got the water from. This is why it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what situation, what broken home you come from. Jesus can make you a great wife. Jesus can make you a great husband. It doesn't matter what kind of background, where the water is being fetched from, whether it was a pit, whether it was a hotel, wherever that water came from, as far as it came towards Jesus, that water became the best wine. And this is the secret of your life, that your, your background doesn't matter. It is the fact that when you're exposed to him, you become the best version of yourself. Jesus can change any life. It doesn't matter where that life comes from. It's transformable. It doesn't matter how much that person makes. They're transformable. It doesn't matter the addiction they've been in. They're transformable. It's a little thing for Jesus to change this water to what? It's a little thing for this water to turn to wine. It just needs to be exposed to the wine master. Jesus is the king of transformation. I don't care how broken your parents' relationship is. Jesus can amend it. Jesus can make that relationship make sense. Jesus can make that relationship become fruitful for you. God is in the era of restoring families. And you have to be a partaker of this. And have the faith to know that if he's it he will do it shout hallelujah